It has now been over 10 years since Gerard learned that his son would be born with Down syndrome. 10 years can pass in the blink of an eye. It seems like only yesterday he set off to film his journey, encountering many inspiring people along the way. Over the 10 years, an unfathomable amount has changed in these lives. Each has a great story to be told. Today, one member of the group is now a renowned doctor, while other lives were cut too short. After 10 years, it is now time to reveal what has happened in their lives. Each an inspirational story. This is their life song for us to hear. Gerard set off to interview the other club members. Club members is an affectionate name that he likes to call people with Down syndrome. It's an exclusive club that you can't join, but are handpicked to become a member. Members are from all walks of life. We start our journey with a visit with Brian Scottco and Dr. Alan Crocker in Boston to see what has changed in their lives in the past 10 years. Back then, Brian was a student at Harvard Medical School specializing in the study of Down syndrome. After contacting Brian, Gerard asked if he had become a doctor yet. When, when your movie, when the documentary comes out, hopefully it'll be true, but let's not jump the gun yet. I'm Dr. Brian Scottco, and I'm one of the medical geneticists here at Massachusetts General Hospital. I've been so fortunate to have so many great mentors. The last time we got together for Dakota's Pride, I was with Dr. Alan Crocker, a giant a grandfather in our field. He unfortunately has since passed away, but I think his legacy lives on forever. And there's not a day that goes by that Alan is not with us. In my office, his picture is staring at me when I arrive, but I also see his footprints in all of the families who advocate every day, all of the patients with Down syndrome who are achieving new things because of the barriers he brought down. And so Alan is with us in many ways through his legacy, and I feel so fortunate to have had him as a mentor. It's exciting that these extraordinary little kids have generated this kind of spirit to become a book and to become the, the uh, happy center of many parent groups and support groups. It's quite clear that there are, well, as you said, common threads. There are, there are elements of spirit that are characteristic of the child and family with Down syndrome that makes our world so much richer. There is one that I use regularly as I'm sort of breaking up from the first session together with the family, a new family. And I say to them, you are beginning what will turn out to be the greatest adventure of your life, period. Alan always had a phrase, carry on. And I think that's so true. We all need to carry on in a celebratory way, but in an advocacy way. There is no better moment to have Down syndrome than today. And that's because all of our predecessors have knocked down some social weeds. But at the same time, there's still a lot of barriers in place. And I think Alan would still be motivating to all of us to say, keep the charges up, keep on fighting the good fight. And at the same time, never forget that the person with Down syndrome 
is the centerpiece and we need to make sure that we're building lives so that they can maximize their full potential. Sure, I have two great sisters. Kristen, of course, has Down syndrome and Allison, my youngest sister of four years, does not. One update since the last time we got together is my youngest sister has become a mother of two children. So Kristen and I are now aunts and uncles. And Kristen just loves being an aunt to Kaylee and Kyle. And what's so beautiful, I think, about children is they don't see nor do they count extra chromosomes. And so Kristen gets there, Aunt Kristen gets there, and they're crawling all over her, and they're reading stories together, and they're watching Disney together, and they share a love of Frozen together, the Disney film. And it is just so authentic, and it is so real to see them interact and to witness such a love between people. You know, all of us adults are kind of hung up in what we're doing. Kristen's down there on the ground playing with them and enjoying life. And whenever I get together with my family, that's what I really enjoy observing and seeing Kristen interact with my niece and nephew. And then I think I just wish the whole world had the viewpoint of my niece and nephew, seeing Kristen for who she is. They're going to grow up and they're going to learn about Down syndrome and they're going to learn about extra chromosomes and they're going to learn about the biology of Down syndrome. What I hope they always remember is that Aunt Kristen is a person and that she's the one who got down on the ground and was with them. and perhaps their best friend and babysitter. So my good colleague Sue Levine and I have done a lot of research on sibling relationships and being a brother myself, it's been so interesting and important to me to analyze and take a look at those interactions. When we survey brothers and sisters who have siblings with Down syndrome, overwhelmingly they say that the positives far outweigh any of the negatives. But it would be inappropriate and irresponsible for us to say that there are not negative, frustrating, difficult moments. And I think that is great because that's part of growing up with siblings. Typical siblings have frustrating and difficult moments. But sometimes those moments could be specific to the Down syndrome movement. And every situation is so different. But what we really encourage brothers and sisters to do is to share their feelings. And what we encourage mothers and fathers to do is to validate those feelings. If someone says, I'm really frustrated my sister did this, a response of, oh, come on, she has Down syndrome, just love her, is very dismissive of those really authentic feelings, even if it was um, something that they should be more accommodating for. But when parents say, geez, that really is frustrating, and if they just say that, that can be very validating for the brother and sister, and then they'll quickly be able to move on. Because I think when we have siblings with Down syndrome, another emotion that starts to creep in is guilt. So it's natural to feel frustrated, it's natural to feel angry, but then seconds, days, weeks later, you feel guilty for feeling that. And so to the extent that parents can validate that we're allowed to have a palette of emotions, I think that allows us to realize that we're human too and it's okay to get frustrated even when the person hurts. Gerard noted that time passes and memories do fade, but no matter how much time passes, we won't forget a good-hearted person like Dr. Alan Crocker. I'd like to imagine he's in heaven right now, surrounded by all the people he's helped. Ironically, we go from a doctor talking about Down syndrome to someone who has it, and his message to future doctors. We caught up with Lee Jones 10 years later, what he's been doing. He's been quite busy uh, traveling around, uh, speaking to all kinds of groups. Um, this event, we caught him speaking to doctors, actually, at one of the local hospitals. Um, and it was quite interesting, actually. So since it's been 10 years since Tocoa's Pride, it sounds like you bought a condominium? That's right, yeah, in, in, in 09. Oh, in 09. Um, and that's why you you said how many jobs do you have now? Five. <laughs> Five. Can right. you name those off again? Well, I well, I do speaking I do speaking on the side. Then a washing machine. That's Mr. Powell. Okay. Because there, I walk there, train there, teach there. So I wasn't a few hats I got there. And the Cotton Foundation, I work there. And and a lot of them on. Monday and Fridays. Wow. Yeah. But I do, I do the speaking on the side. 
Okay. And you said what you said. Um, one of your goals you just you wanted to you just accomplish. What was that again? Zip lining. First. Yeah. Zip lining. Zip lining. Yeah, I did that. I loved it. Did you? Where'd you do that at? In, in Kauai. Oh, okay. That sounds like fun. Anything else you'd like to tell the people that haven't seen you in 10 years on the video, that they catch them up to date? Well, I'm now 40 years old now. So I had a birthday last year in January. Happy birthday. Thank you. Can't believe it. A little inspiration goes a long way. But after seeing Lee Jones drive himself to do things that people said he could never do, one can be motivated for a lifetime. Despite having Down syndrome, he has his own driver's license and car, graduated from a four-year college, has a black belt, is an expert scuba diver, and has many other talents. Well, talking to these parents, I guess when Dakota's old enough and moves out on his own, I wanted to see what other possibilities were out there and what other people were doing. And we ran into the best group, and they are individuals with uh, Down syndrome that perform and do dance and songs. My dream is to be a, a professional singer, dancer, a dance teacher, a writer, and acting, and being a lawyer but my parents cannot afford a law school. <laughs> but I did everything except for that one. You said you've done everything you wanted to do except be a lawyer. Have you pursued becoming a lawyer yet? Never gonna happen. <laughs> okay. I think you may be too busy to be a lawyer. Um, yeah. <laughs> She's got some important stuff to do here. What do you want to do in the next 10 years? Next 10 years? Being the best who I am. So, Audrey, what's the largest group of people you've spoken to? Um, 25,000, so I... I think it's 2,500 when you did the... It was the national... Um, oh, it's a student council thing. Okay. It was the National Student Council Convention, and it yeah. was at... Where was it at? I can't remember. Overland Park Convention Center? Yeah, I think that's what, yeah, I think that's what it is. It was at Overland Park Convention Center, and there were 2,500 students from all across the country, from every state, and their advisors, and she got a standing ovation, several standing ovations. Yeah. She'd barely get a few words out of her mouth from her speech, and, and they would stand up and clap, and yeah, so it was, that was really one of the... That was the best day of my whole life there. That was really awesome. So oh, yeah, she's had opportunity. They've all had, well, a few of them have had opportunities to travel and spend the night in hotels and... In boom shoes. That's yeah. what I love. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them about when we went down to... Um, oh, yeah. Where my, was that little no, no. little town we went to? Webb City or... I don't know. It was the town in Missouri, but it was after the National Student Council Convention. We got several after that just to go to high schools. And so we went to their student council, Their I think it was their state. Student Council. And how did they treat you down there when you were going to the car and stuff? Oh, uh, yeah. I'll leave with that one. Um, like a rock star, because <laughs> they they want my um, autograph. They were all gathered around waiting for her autograph, and then and, and the other guys, and we were going to the van. And they were following us out to the van and <laughs> waving cool. us off the lot. And that, that's way cool. If your child so, shows an interest, your young adult shows an interest in something, um, you might pursue that for a lifestyle because there was no program for the arts for people with disabilities at that time. And we decided to look at what Audrey wanted to do with the rest of her life. Yeah, I would say that's been the greatest thing for us to pursue what her interest was. Um, they call it a person-centered plan. So you take the person's ideas and plans and plan something for their life around that. It's kind of what we all should yeah. do to have a happy life. You know, you get in jobs that you don't really appreciate or 
get in situations you don't appreciate if you take control of your life and control of your individual with um, disabilities lives and create something that they're interested in, it makes a huge difference. It brings a lot of joy and happiness and they're satisfied and happy. What do they say? You never work a day in your life. Well, she, <laughs> she gets to do her passion every day. After interviewing the Wagnons, it so happened that it was rehearsal night for the best group. If it's true that God is most happy when his children are at joyful play, then he must surely be smiling at these folks. Wow. She did an 800 meter freestyle. She was the only USA athlete to swim it. Yes. She did a 400 meter freestyle. She did a 200 meter freestyle and she helped in a 4 by 50 relay race. Wow, congratulations. And she got silver in everything she did. So we wow. dubbed her the Silver Queen. There you wow. go. Otherwise known as Flounder, because that was her nickname for Ireland. Oh, Flounder. yeah. So we were very excited to find out that Rachel was getting married. Um, she found somebody that she fell in love with and was very excited about that. Um, we got a different kind of invitation than we were expecting. Um, and we caught up with her mom to talk more about that. I am Mary Pat Cassidy. I am the mother of Rachel O'Brien. And Rachel would be almost 33. October 27th would be her 33rd birthday. Well, I think the last time we met, we had been to Ireland. After that, Rachel won the Physically Challenged Athlete of the Year through the WIN, the Women's Inter Inter Sports Network, I believe it is, WIN KC. And then we went to Nationals in Ames, Iowa, and she won three golds there on Team Missouri with Special Olympics. And then in 2008, we worked and got ourselves to Portugal through the International Down Syndrome Swimming Organization. And there were 10 kids from the United States that went, and it was much more intense than, spe than Special Olympics. It was like regular college or Olympic competition. It was extreme. And then we, re we retired from swimming internationally. She still continued all the local Special Olympics things. And um, then we, she met Tony through uh, Special Olympics bowling. And uh, they started going out six years ago, if I'm thinking. Yeah, six years ago. And... Uh, Life was wonderful, and they were going to get married or have a commitment ceremony. Let's put it that way. We were going to have a commitment cer ceremony in July, and um, February 7th, we went bowling. She had a minor leg cramp, took some leave, and while we were at the bowling alley, Rachel collapsed and uh, they were not able to revive her. She had um, pulmonary embolism, which is basically a blood clot, and um, there wasn't going to be, I mean, they, they, the paramedics weren't going to be able to revive her. It just, it, it was immediate. And they call it DVT, deep vein thrombosis. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that happens. We did, Rachel had signed, um, when she got her, her license, or her, her state ID, I guess is what it is, um, she had signed up to be a donor. And they did a, um, the Midwest transplant tissue donors. And they told her, they told me that with all that they, that was donated, there was the possibility of helping over 50 people. 
and there was what valves, cornea, tissue, um, veins, um, heart, yeah, the heart valves. Um, I can't remember everything, but they go in and, and take everything that's good for others because you're not gonna use it anymore. And she didn't quite understand organ donor, but her dad had a heart transplant. And so we taught, we, she understood what it was and we talked about it. And she was like, yeah, that's the good thing to do because it helps people. And so she will always be helping through others. You know, she'll, she'll benefit others who need it. Tell them who you are. Yeah, I'm Tony Hall, Rachel's uh, Cinnabon, uh, uh, trying to... yeah. I was her fiance, gonna be her uh, uh, husband. Yeah, yeah. Uh, her husband. We had a purple party, didn't we? Yeah, we had a purple party for her, and it was fun. Okay, what's a purple party? Well, since it was going to be their wedding day, we needed a party. Yeah. And Rachel's favorite color was purple. So we had a purple party. Okay. And we had like a little reception, didn't we? We had all a bunch of friends and family come. Yeah. And we had a big fancy like a, oh, like a wedding cake. Yeah. yeah. We made it into a good day. Yeah. It was a rough day, but we made it into a good day. Yep, I think about Rachel every day. Every time I get out of bed, I... Do you have dreams? Yeah. Does she still come in your dreams? Yeah. Dreams. I even catch a picture of her when she won, uh, won a Special Olympics, uh, Special Olympics uh, game. I catch a picture every day. I play Boone and Mars mostly every day. <laughs> and I just catch a picture a lot. I miss her so much. I wish she was still here. So don't we all? Yeah, she, she made she made the she made the good day happen. When I have, I have a, when I have like a rough day at some place, she made me so happy. I was so calm and collected. She made me happy when I have when I have like a, have like a rough day. I absolutely love that girl. <laughs> There's not gonna be another girl like her in the world. Rachel's smile still has a lasting impression on Gerard's heart. So much so that she came to him in a dream, telling him to make a second Dakota's Pride to help her fiancé, Tony, with his grief. We're not doing as much with the Guild as we once were. Last time we talked to you, we were actually leading the group. We've kind of stepped back. We've really gotten uh, more involved with Matthew's ministry. In fact, we, were, uh, we spoke one night in front of the church on behalf or gave a little talk about what was going on, and Dakota just really enjoys that. That's one of his brightest days of, of the year. In fact, he just counts down the minutes until he can go. And we, we got to talk to Jennifer, who runs the program. My name is Jennifer Ross. I am the Matthews Ministry Director at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. Matthews Ministry is the ministry at our church for people with special needs of all ages. Matthew's ministry was started in 1993 for a young man named Matthew Joyner. He was severely disabled and um, his parents visited the church for the first time. Matthew was unable to come with his parents and Pastor Adam happened to stop by their house to deliver a coffee mug and saw Matthew um, ask the parents why they didn't bring him with them to church. And they said, well, your church is really nice, but you're not gonna be able to take care of our son. And he said, well, just tell me what you need and, and give us a couple of weeks. And I promise you, we, we wanna be your church home. And so um, Adam came back to the church, asked for volunteers, um, got 40 people to sign up, and um, that's how Matthew's ministry began for one child named Matthew. Thank you. I, I really love the joy of, of the kids coming in every day. Um, and when I've had a really rough day, or 
or I'm in meetings all day, I can't wait to sneak down to the learning program and just walk into the room because it's like a celebrity has walked in. They are like, Jennifer, hi, we love you, you know? And, and it just, you know, it's really good for your ego. <laughs> they are, they're generally happy to see you. Um, I love doing the bakery with them. You know, I thought I was a pretty good uh, cook. I had done a dessert business and, and knew a little bit about baking. But what I didn't know was how to modify everything so that our individuals could be successful at those tasks. Many members of Matthew's ministry are involved in the missions trips. One member with Down syndrome was even a translator for the rest of the staff. Hi, um, this is my friend Laura Bell. Laura went with us on a mission trip to the Ukraine in 2005. Remember when you and, and, and Sasha Mustache would talk to when we didn't understand what he was saying and you would, you would tell us what he had said in German? Yeah, as, uh, we lived in Germany for a while because she speaks German only. And she and I went to school in Wiesbaden. And so when Pastor, I mean, when Sasha Mustache would talk to you, then you would tell us in English what he said, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite German phrase? Uh, the term German food. That's Grace stuff too. Melissa Walleen has Grant and Grace. Um, so she's got, you know, the dual Down syndrome. She adopted one with Down syndrome and then had one avert naturally with Down syndrome. And um, she had a lot of great advice. There's things that we've had conversations before and you're like, oh, remember Melissa told us that. And, you know, it's just, and I just, you know, it's not even just those two people. It's just so many people in the community right. that have older kids, you know, they'll tell you things about their kids and pretty soon you're like, oh, look, there's my kids doing that just like they said they would. I am Melissa Walleen. I good morning. Grace Walleen. This is my youngest daughter, my only daughter, but my fifth child. Things over the last 10 years that we have learned and what they've done and experienced. Um, Grant was, what, 13 back then, and he has finished great middle school and high school and the three year. Uh, program from that that we have here in Blue Valley and then he's now at a program an all-day program called Life Centers and he's on a wait list for another program that we have here in Kansas City that's a paid program uh, we have a good problem here and that there's a lots of different things that you can do you can do recycling you can do uh, faux finishing of furniture so par some parents started that in Shawnee that's not in his wheelhouse and right now he his program is nine to two he takes a oh, bus he, your brother's here yeah Grant well we'll introduce him when he comes in the door do you like your do you like your school? Yeah. What'd you do today? Did you go hi. Did you go bowling? Yeah. Did you yeah. go bowling? You went bowling? I have Jordan. I have Kyle. Um, we have Grant and we had Berkeley. That's our fourth those are our four boys. And then we adopted Grace at birth. She's Korean. And um this year we lost Berkeley to a fifteen month bout battle of cancer and um People have asked me a lot about whether it how it impacted Grant and Grace because he was right in the middle of them, and Grace ended up by kind of not feeling well at school. And the the teacher called me and said I asked Grace if she wanted to go to the nurse because she said she didn't feel well. And when Grace said no, she didn't want to go to the nurse. The teacher asked her why, and she said because when you go to the nurse, you go to the doctor. When you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital. When you go to the hospital, you don't come home. So how it impacted them is they obviously know they are grieving alongside of us. And I think it's just such a reminder about, um, you know, we should assume that they can, they do, and they will, as opposed to, oh, they probably don't understand and never will. So that was a lesson for me, how, how strongly it, she was hurting. Gerard noted that you never really get over the death of a loved one. At best, you get used to it. After the interview, we followed Gerard home to explore what had happened in Dakota's life over the past 10 years.
We've had a lot of changes in our lives, good and challenging as every parent has. Um, the biggest thing that I think I've learned in the last 10 years is one, just to appreciate all your children for what they are. Um, I see sometimes a lot of people try to make their kids into things that they want them to be and not what the kids want to be. And that's probably one of the biggest thing that our, that our kids have taught me is, you know, they're, they're going to be a lot different than I thought they were going to be, I guess. We had an uh, interesting experience. We were living in an area. Um, we were going and meeting with which was going to be Dakota's future group. And um, it was just a very awkward. So we pulled stakes and we moved to a different part of a school system. And I think it was one of the best things we did. He's had a great experience. Um, the kids have been great with him. He's had just over the top birthday parties. He's been invited to things, is which you know you always want for your children. Um, and we we had a chance to sit down with two of his teachers. The one was the special ed room or the resource room, um, whatever it's called, properly called. And her name is Mrs. Rudd, but she's been married and it's she's married and now her name is Mrs. Lyon. Yeah, and she was great to work with Dakota, and she got to know him for five years in elementary school. And then the last teacher he had um, before he went to middle school is Mrs. Miss, Miss Cheney. Sorry, um, she's his fifth grade. Was yeah. his fifth grade teacher. My name is Kristen Lyon, and I'm Dakota's special education teacher. I started working with him when he was in first grade, and I opened the program here at Prairie Star Elementary for kids with special needs. I've been working with him for the past five years, and now he's in fifth grade and getting ready to graduate and head to the middle school. Dakota's typical day um, kind of consists, he, he spends time in my classroom and then also his general education classroom. And I think there's a lot of idea that it's maybe like half the day in here and half the day in there. And it's, it's really not half and half. It's pretty back and forth throughout the day. Um, he, he's in my classroom for one-on-one -on -one academics and math and reading. He participates in some small groups in my setting. Um, but he joins his typical peers throughout the day for specials and lunch and recess and read aloud and buddies. And if they have library checkout, he joins them for that. Um, and he joins them at the beginning and the end of every day. So it's kind of back and forth, but um, he has a good amount of time in both settings. I think parents, if I'm thinking just parents of kids with Down syndrome or any special need, I think when they hear that their child needs to be in an intensive program um, and receive intensified instruction, I think that that's super scary. Um, and I think there's this huge push, and I totally get it, for full inclusion and you know, keep them in the gen ed classroom 100% of the time. And I think it's really eye-opening for parents when educators say, oh, well, we, we think your child would learn better in a different environment. And, and I think there's a lot of fear that that means they're no longer going to be with their typical peers. And that's so not the case. Um, the kids all are totally different. I have several, I have five students with Down syndrome on my caseload right now. And they all have varying amounts of time in gen ed. Some of them are out more than others. Some of them enjoy that setting more than others. Um, so it's just about what is each kid, how do they benefit, what type of setting is best for them, um, where they can learn and they feel comfortable. It's not about what we want for them. It's about where they feel like they fit in. Um, so I think just knowing that you didn't fail as a parent and the teachers didn't fail if 100% mainstream or 100% inclusion doesn't work for your kid. Um, my name is Michelle Cheney. I'm Dakota's fifth grade teacher. I've been at Prairie Star for four years now and have absolutely loved having Dakota in my class this year. Earlier on in the year, I had put a picture of myself, just one of my school pictures, on Dakota's desk as a joke, and he did not like it. He's like, get this thing out of here. I don't want this on my desk. So the next day, I put another one in there, and then another teacher put a picture of herself in there as well. And then he got upset about that, but he always laughs and he pretends like he's upset, but we always kind of joke around with each other. And he came in the next day and we all left for specials to go to music. And I came back in and he had taken stickers of himself and put them all over my desk kind of to get back at me. So the kids in the class thought it was hilarious and the pictures are still on my desk and then I kind of got him back again and I took a massive picture of myself like an 8 by 11 picture and taped it onto his desk and he came in the next day and was just cracking up he thought it was so funny and he, that one's been on there for a few months now he hasn't taken that one off 
overall, I am so thankful that I got to have Dakota in my class this year. We worked really well together. We had an amazing year. And I'm just so thankful that I got to know him. While it has been 10 years for the club members, each has experienced their unique journey, rewards, and challenges. Janie Foltz retired from IDC. IDC is still going strong and helping children and their parents. Nicole and Derek moved away and declined to be interviewed for the second film. Whatever journey these people will take next, it'll be wonderful to see what happens in the next 10 years. As with all of us, if given the chance and some hope, the possibilities are endless.